following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So we're going to talk about the basis of meditation, what meditation is and is not, what's required to really meditate, what does it mean, what's, what's it for, what's the purpose, and how do we make it something that's practical and effective, not just a theory or a belief, but something that we can actually benefit from. Throughout any system of meditation, no matter what system you study, no matter what tradition or background you may have. The central purpose of meditation and the point of meditation is to come about change, to try to address our fundamental problems. And so really it's something that's based in facts, focused on facts. Meditation is not really useful if it's just about beliefs and theories. So when we observe humanity, we look at this world that we live in, we see a lot of problems, a lot of suffering, a lot of things that seem impossible to understand or change. And the amount of suffering that we see in humanity and that we see in the world is actually really overwhelming. But meditation provides a way for us to work on that and change that. So for spirituality to be really effective, it has to be on this foundation, practical facts, dealing with suffering, dealing with fundamental problems that we face, not only as individuals, but as a society. And if we can't solve some of those problems, or at least understand them, then our spirituality is really pointless, useless. We need to understand how to use our spirituality for the benefit of not only ourselves, but other people. And that's the basis that we start from in, in this tradition. So it starts with observation of facts, not beliefs, not theories. Real meditation and real spirituality begins with facts. And this first thing is for some people very difficult. <laughs> All of us have cherished beliefs and ideas and theories things that we want to be certain ways, maybe religious or spiritual ideas, maybe ideas about who we are as a person or how our culture is or our society. We have a whole huge collection of beliefs, but still we suffer. So if we really want to address the nature of our suffering, if we really want to change that, the first thing that we have to be willing to do is set aside belief. To set aside those ideas and notions that we have about ourselves and about the world and set aside everything that we cannot prove. Instead, deal only in facts, observable facts, repeatable facts. If you think about this and you analyze this, you will realize that it forms a very powerful basis for your spiritual life. 
Because if you believe something and you cannot prove it, you could spend a lifetime believing in something that was not real and thus waste that lifetime. Wouldn't it be better to take the approach that all the great teachers gave, which is to pursue that which you can prove? And all the great traditions have that in their scriptures and in their teachings, but people set that aside. They want to just believe because it's easier. They want to just adopt a theory or a belief or a way of behaving and just think and imagine that that's going to be their redemption, their, their salvation from suffering. But they cannot prove it. So observation of facts is where we begin if we really want to develop an effective spiritual life and an effective meditation practice. This alone can be very difficult. Many people who meditate have a lot of cherished beliefs about meditation. They may believe that they are already at a given stage of development. And they may not observe the actual facts that may prove otherwise. Maybe they are not at that stage of development. But they're unwilling to let go of their beliefs. So if we are sincerely interested in developing an effective spiritual life, we have to start with that. Not believing things about ourselves spiritually or psychologically, but looking at the facts of what really is in our spiritual life. What are the genuine truths that we can confirm and observe in our spiritual life? The second important basis is consciousness. And this is because to observe something means that we need to perceive it. And consciousness is the basis of perception. If we cannot be in a position to observe a fact, then we cannot become conscious of it. This is a critical and important basis of any spiritual pursuit. Any real spiritual life is based on working with consciousness. Now, every living thing has consciousness in its level. Everything in nature. Every atom, every molecule, every organ, every structure, every organism has consciousness. It has life. It has the ability to perceive at its own level. So, factually speaking, we look at the facts of what we can confirm for ourselves about that. We know that plants respond to their environment. They can perceive. That means they have consciousness at the level of a plant. And animals are the same. Animals have consciousness at the level of an animal. We do too. We can perceive our environment. We can become conscious of things and aware of things. So we have consciousness at our level. What we don't realize is that consciousness itself is a force in nature that is infinite in its potential. We all who pursue spirituality and who are interested in religion have heard about masters, Buddhas, angels, bodhisattvas, uh, all kinds of superior beings. And those are Beings that have consciousness at their level. It's different from ours. But what we may not realize is that all of those superior types of beings were human beings like us once. But that expanded their consciousness, developed it, perfected it, and became capable of things that we can scarcely imagine. So we have in us the capability to become like that, and that's why they've given religions to us, spirituality to us. We are, in a sense, seeds. Undeveloped. But with the potential to become something incredible. Like a Buddha. Like Jesus. Like Moses. Like all of those great teachers that we've all heard about and we respect and admire and long to understand... But they were all once just like us. Human beings with problems. 
human beings with limited perception, but who worked in the facts of their lives to change their perception and become something greater. So we all have that capability. In the Buddhist tradition, that is called Tathagata Garbha. And that term can be interpreted a few different ways, but what it really means is the embryo or seed of a Buddha. It's the potential to become a Buddha. In modern translations, usually you hear that called Buddha nature. So we all have that potentiality in us, the, the potential, the inner nature that can become that if we know how to do it. In English, this is called soul in the Western traditions. We have the potential to have that. And those who really study the Bible will notice that Jesus didn't say that we had a soul. He said, with patience, you will possess your soul. It's something that has to be developed. So consciousness is the basis of learning about meditation. Meditation itself is an act of consciousness. It is a state of consciousness. It is a type of perception. Meditation is not a practice. It is not spacing out. It isn't fantasizing or daydreaming. It isn't avoiding problems or avoiding life. It isn't about having some type of sensational ecstasy with physical sensations. Instead, real meditation is a form of perception in which the consciousness is awake, free of conditioning, Utterly liberated, simple, happy, but perceiving. The way you perceive through your eyes and through your nose and through your skin and your ears and your tongue, but with a different sense, with a different range and a different power. We all have that. Consciousness provides that. And meditation is the state where that is activated. So here in this image, we see... From the west and from the east, two maps of consciousness. This one, with these ten spheres arranged in a particular pattern, is called the tree of life. It is the basis of the Judeo-Christian traditions, but most people in those traditions don't know about this thing because they've never been taught about it, even though it's in the Bible. It simply represents, in a visual way, levels of nature, levels that are within us. It represents who we are from top to bottom in our relationship with nature and the divine. And that same symbol is represented in the East in this image that's called Baba Chakra. Some call it the wheel of life or the wheel of samsara. But the real name is Baba Chakra. And that means the wheel of becoming. Both represent the same thing with a slightly different point of view. And if we study them both and compare them with each other, we can learn a lot. Most people study these only in relation with the outside world or in relation with beliefs and theories. But the real meaning is about ourselves. These graphics help us understand our state of being, what we can call our level of being, who we are as a person. What are our characteristics? What are our qualities? Why is our life the way that it is? When we study these symbols, they help us understand who we are. And not only that, but they help us understand who we can become. And that's why that's called the wheel of becoming. It's meant to be understood as something that's in motion, not something still, not something that's stagnant and fixed and permanent, but something that is constantly moving and constantly changing. It is a great wheel, and the motion of that wheel is produced by how we behave from moment to moment, how we use our consciousness. So we've given 
courses and courses about these symbols. So I'm just introducing them to you today so that you can get the idea and little by little we'll talk more and more about them. In essence, as I mentioned, they both represent the states of consciousness. They represent ourselves as a psychology and they represent that infinite capacity or potential of the consciousness to be developed. So on the tree of life, we see this whole string of sephirah, sephiroth, which in singular is sephirah. And that word literally means jewel, gem. And if you've studied the book of Revelation, you'll read about the tree of life and the beautiful gemstones that adorn the well-developed being. These sephiroth represent levels of consciousness, levels of potential development. So if we were to look at all of the beings that exist in nature, in all of the infinite universes, in all the infinite levels of life, from the subatomic to the macrocosmic, they can all be represented in all these levels of existence. The very lowest levels are what we can call the hell realms. Right here, this lowest white sphere is Malkut, which means the kingdom, which Jesus spoke a lot about. That represents physicality, the physical world. And above that, we see many more spheres, and those are all superior levels. We can call them heavens or nirvanas. Levels of existence that are just as real as this one, but more subtle, more refined in a higher vibration of nature. And these are places, both the superior levels and the inferior levels, that all of us have experienced. But we don't realize it. We experience them through our dreams. The Bible's full of stories about people being out of their body and God takes them here and there, and they have different visions and experiences. And stories about people traversing the lower worlds, like the Divine Comedy of Dante. All of that's mapped here on this image. But what's more interesting is that all of those levels of existence are inside of us. They're all within our own psychology. Those hell realms are our infraconsciousness, our unconsciousness, our subconsciousness. When we have a nightmare, we are in our own hell realms. We are experiencing those submerged worlds. They are inside of us. That is where we find our anger, our fear, our lust, our envy, our greed, our gluttony, all of those qualities that make us suffer, that are inside of us. Those are mapped here on this image. And superior to that, above the physical body, are all the virtues, all of the beautiful qualities that our consciousness has, like generosity, patience, conscious love, the ability to sacrifice for others, diligence, the ability to work hard, all of the virtues that are naturally part of a free and unconditioned consciousness are represented in that part of that image. And we find the same here. This great wheel represents those same realms in another way. The lower realms are the inferior worlds and the superior realms are above. So these symbols represent our own psychology. Now, <clears throat> All of this that I'm describing in this sort of general way has been taught before. We're not seeing anything new. It's nothing brand new to anyone. But the way that it's taught has varied over the centuries and according to the level of teaching that a person has had access to. Most people who study meditation and who study spirituality only know about the most superficial levels of it. 
So we can call that the introductory levels of teaching. In Buddhism, they have a good word for this. It's called sutrayana. And this refers to that type of teaching that you hear about. You hear about it from your friends and family. You hear about it from books in the bookstore. Nowadays, you can hear about it on the internet, on TV shows, videos, all that type of material that's easy to get to and that's fairly commonly known. So these symbols and these structures are all taught in those levels of instruction, introductory levels. So if you go to any Buddhist monastery, you will find images of that wheel and images like this one that relate to meditation. It's very easy to find. It's introductory level instruction. Specifically in relation with meditation, we find very easily nowadays, anywhere, meditation instruction. Books, videos, classes, and everybody nowadays thinks they know what meditation is because they've heard this introductory aspect. So here we put this word exoteric. And that means externally available, publicly available, easy to find. Something you can hear about on the street. But that is not the sum total of what meditation is or what spirituality is. To think that meditation is only what people say about it in the cafe or on the street corner would be the same to think that by hearing somebody talk about how to take your Advil or your aspirin, now you know everything there is to know about being a doctor. It's basically the same. So meditation is a very deep, very precise science. The second level of instruction we could call intermediate. In Buddhism, it's called Mahayana. That means the greater vehicle. So it's a step above the introductory vehicle. We would call this mesoteric because it's in the middle. And this is the type of instruction that you would generally get once you've already mastered or, or developed some ability with the introductory techniques, the introductory teachings. Of course, there's a third level. In Buddhism, they call it Tantrayana. These three levels exist in every religion, historically speaking. But nowadays, most religions and most traditions have lost the differences between these structures and in fact have thrown out a lot of that material because it doesn't give them power, it doesn't help them retain the largest potential congregation. It doesn't help them get rich. Which really, honestly speaking, is what many religions want. Many spiritual teachers and, and groups really are interested in just having the biggest church and having the largest donations that they can and the largest congregation. And that's really it. Or they want to help people feel better about their lives, but they can't offer them real fundamental, practical tools to help them change. And so they cut out all the stuff that they didn't understand or that people weren't interested in. In our tradition, we study all three of these simultaneously. But our central interest is in how they are practical. We have no interest in debate, in theory or belief. None. We don't care what you believe. You can believe anything you want. If you want to believe that part of the population of this planet are lizard people from another planet, you are welcome to believe it. We really don't care. And I'm telling you that because there are people who believe that. Honestly. And it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter what we believe or what theories we have. What matters is how do we use our consciousness from moment to moment? How are we using it? Because that's what's producing our quality of life. That's what's producing our level of being. So when we study meditation, and we teach meditation here in this tradition, we are studying and teaching all three of these levels. And they are different. They're very different. 
In the Sutrayana level, the introductory level, you learn basic concentration practices, relaxation practices, maybe some breathing exercises. That's pretty much it. It's a very simple, practical, but very limited range of tools. So as I mentioned, most people who think they know about meditation only know about that. They think meditation is sitting in this very uncomfortable looking position and sort of spacing out for a little while. That has nothing to do with real meditation. In this first level of instruction, generally what a person learns is how to stabilize themselves psychologically. How to become calm, how to become serene, how to develop equanimity. And so they learn practices like how to concentrate, how to relax, how to observe. These are essential. They start the process of learning meditation. Every meditator needs to know those things. They also learn what causes the mind, the consciousness, the heart, and the body to have tension, to have disequilibrium, to be imbalanced, to be in pain, to be suffering. What causes that? You learn that in the introductory level. And what it's called is ethics. We could say morality maybe, but that's not really a good word. Ethics is a better word. You could also call it karma, cause and effect. The person in the introductory level of instruction is learning, if I behave in this way, this is always the result. If I say this word, it causes this reaction. If I think this thought, it causes this reaction. If I act towards one person in this certain manner, it causes this reaction. It causes me to be out of balance. Or it causes this other person to suffer. That's all related to the introductory level. It's very much concerned with one's own state of being. And when you go on to the next level, meaning that you've already learned that, and you've started to change, you've started to modify your behaviors, you start to learn about the Mahayana level, and that level is more concerned about other people not about yourself. It's more concerned with how can I help others not suffer? Now that I'm already working on changing my own perception, changing my own behaviors, I need to expand that out and start helping the people around me, changing my behaviors for their benefit. So you see this level is where the virtue starts to really emerge in a person, where their altruism and generosity and love and patience start to become more important. And when a person is really seriously working in that way, they can be introduced into the advanced level, which is called in Buddhism Tantrayana, where they want even more expedient ways to help other people. Even more effective to expand their capacity and their abilities even more. So if you look at these three, you see a shift. In the beginning, we're all very much concerned about ourselves, like we all are now. Myself, my suffering, my life. I want this and I don't have it. Or I have this problem and I want to get rid of it. It's all about me. And that's the state of humanity is all about I. Real spirituality and real meditation gradually guides the person through practical facts to learn that when you take the attention off of yourself and you begin to shift that away and be more mindful and attentive to the needs of others, not only do you help other people, your own suffering reduces. You start to realize that the things that you thought were so painful and awful in your life really have no meaning at all in comparison with the suffering of others. That shift in attitude is the essential point of these three structures. Some people see these levels and they think, oh, I want to skip all that beginning stuff 
And I want to get right to the secret teachings. I want to go right into the esoteric knowledge and skip all that other stuff. Those people are foolish. These three work together and they have to work together. They form an essential structure. Now, through those levels of instruction, the practice of meditation also changes. In the introductory level, a person learns to relax and concentrate. So they start stabilizing their psychological uh, experience. But they only learn concentration. So in some traditions, they may learn to repeat a mantra. They may learn to uh, focus on the breath, observing the process of breathing. They may focus on a deity and observe a statue or observe a, a sacred character of some kind or repeat a prayer. All those exercises to concentrate attention, which are necessary. But in those beginning levels, the introductory level, the students are told to strictly avoid imagination. To strictly avoid it. And the reason is that it's because they need to learn concentration first. But when you get to the next level, Mahayana level, you are introduced to how to use imagination as part of your meditation practice. And when you get to the Tantrayana level, the advanced level, the imagination becomes even more important. Now those traditions, we, there are different terms used for them. Shamatha and Vipassana. If you've studied meditation at all, specifically related with Tibetan Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism, those are the terms that you'll hear or come across. And they can also be called calm embodying and insight. This is what we teach. We don't teach strictly and only the most basic beginning level of meditation. We do teach how to concentrate. We do teach how to become serene, to have meditative stability, which is this concentration aspect. But more than that, we teach you how to use, harness the very power of the consciousness, which is to perceive, not just through your physical senses, but through your imagination. You see, this word imagination has a bad reputation nowadays. We think that imagination isn't real. We think that imagination is something fake. But there's another word that caused this to happen. A few centuries ago, some people that were studying this type of material wanted to keep it secret. So they invented a new word to hide what they were actually studying, and they called it clairvoyance. That means clear seeing in French. Clairvoyance is imagination. It's the same thing. In Sanskrit, it is vipassana. That word simply means insight. Now, what's interesting is in our modern culture, we look at imagination and we say, ah, that's garbage. But at the same time, we are so mystified by people like Beethoven, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Einstein. Do you know how they did what they did? Every one of them said it, the power of imagination. Do you know how the great artists created their creations? They closed their physical eyes and they looked into their internal eyes. Now, right now, most of us, when we close our physical eyes, we see nothing. But there is a sense there, that power of imagination, that when we were children, we had it in abundance. We could sit down and immediately imagine up whole worlds and big stories and huge epic dramas that we would live out. And we would be so happy, engaged in that activity because we were using the power of the consciousness as a child would use it. But here's the key. 
That same power of the consciousness is the consciousness that a master uses or a Buddha uses to investigate phenomena in nature. It's the exact same thing, but instead of being at the level of a child, it's at the level of a Buddha. We have that skill. We just need to develop it. So that's what we teach. How to utilize concentration in combination with imagination. And when you unite those two, you access a doorway inside yourself. That door is called meditation. That is a door through which you perceive beyond the physical senses. It is not imaginary. It is not fantasy. It is not fake. It is real. And it's something that's inside of every living thing. We have just conditioned ourselves so deeply in bad habits that we've lost the ability to do it. We can recover that. So what that gives us access to is what in Sanskrit is called pragna. That word loosely translated means wisdom. But it's a very profound type of wisdom. It's something that's far beyond the you know, clever quotes and platitudes of a so-called wise person. This word is, in Sanskrit, it's called a paramita, which means a perfection. It's a quality of the consciousness. It's a quality of a being. So when you study, for example, the teachings of Jesus or the teachings of Buddha or Krishna or Padmasambhava or Milarepa any, or Moses, any of these great teachers, you see the profound wisdom that they had. A great example is Solomon. If you've studied the story of Solomon in the Bible, that's all he wanted from God was wisdom. He didn't want riches. And when he received that gift of wisdom, it's this. It's this prania, wisdom, which in Hebrew is the word chokmah, which is way up here at the top of the tree of life. That's a quality of consciousness. That type of profound wisdom is a type of perception that sees reality. It's not confused. It doesn't become filtered by anything in the mind. It sees what truly is. It is the perception that a Buddha has, that a master has, that a great prophet has, an avatar, any type of word that you want to use for that. If you look at it and you really contemplate it, you realize that this is the type of perception that allowed the Buddha Shakyamuni to understand the causes of suffering and then teach others about it and thus started Buddhism. It's the type of wisdom and perception that Jesus had when he was capable of cutting through the incredible difficulties that he faced and able to help so many people. And likewise, Krishna and Moses, all of them had this profound perception about reality. We have that in us, the potential for that. And to reach it, we need to utilize samadhi. This term is uh, open for a lot of interpretation, but what it essentially boils down to, a state of being, a state of consciousness that is not conditioned by any ego, by any psychological defect. It is a part, it is where we as a soul, as a consciousness, as a Buddha nature, are completely unconditioned by anger, fear, pride, anything. And we experience our true nature liberated. When you meditate and you learn to meditate effectively, you can experience that. It's a state of being. It's a state of consciousness. And there's levels and levels and levels of it. But to reach prana, profound wisdom, you only can reach it through samadhi, through the consciousness being extracted from defects. So when we look at this chart, the tree of life, we see, here's our physical body at the bottom. Our consciousness, which descends from our inner being, is here now in our physical bodies. We are here perceiving. We are conscious of listening and studying this material. 
But our consciousness is conditioned by this physical body. By the five senses. Furthermore, it's also conditioned by the psychology that we have right now. By our mood. By the tendency of the mind to think and be distracted. By emotions that may be surging in us. We may feel fear. We may feel anticipation or excitement. We may feel any number of emotional qualities that condition that consciousness even more. Because of that, every little layer of conditioning limits the ability of the consciousness to perceive the truth. Every conditioning filters that perception. So if we came to the lecture feeling angry, we would hear everything through the anger. If we came to the lecture feeling scared, Maybe we have a situation in our lives that are causing fear in us, and we feel that fear all the time. We would only hear the lecture through the fear. Our perception would be conditioned. That is not a state of samadhi. It's a state of conditioning. So to learn to meditate means to learn how to take the consciousness out of all that conditioning. Anyone can do that. But to do it, you have to see the conditioning. You have to be able to recognize it for what it is and extract oneself from it. So, an obvious example. If you're feeling anger, you have to be able to see that anger and say, okay, I feel angry. I'm just going to relax and let it go. And it will. But it won't unless you see it. Unless you perceive it. If you see the facts of it. Same with any other conditioning factor, including the physical body. We have to become very aware of the body and very aware of the psyche that conditions our perception. If we learn to do that very effectively, the consciousness can escape out of all that conditioning and it can experience the reality. It may not be something like seeing angels and Buddhas and the clouds part and, you know, all these celestial beings come down to us. It may be as simple as a sudden feeling of just being free and happy and content and serene. But an undeniable happiness, which incidentally is the natural unconditioned state of our consciousness. When the consciousness is liberated from its conditioning, it is perfectly serene. Spontaneously, naturally, on its own. It's happy. It is joyful. It is loving. It is patient. It has all of those virtues in it. That's its natural state. To be stressed and angry and tense and fearful is unnatural. So the meditation that we learn is not to force the mind to be quiet or to impose upon it some type of fake serenity. Instead, it is the opposite. It is to recognize all of the conditioning that stops it and back away from it. Release all those conditions. Recognize them, release them. And when the process is thorough, the consciousness is liberated spontaneously, naturally, automatically by itself without any effort, without any exertion. So in this sense, we can say meditation is actually really easy. It's a matter of learning how to relax physically and psychologically. That's how we can access samadhi. We call it ecstasy because it is an ecstasy of the soul. It is an ecstasy of the heart, not the body, not physically. It's an ecstasy of the being, of who we really are. And we reach that through this very first factor, which in Sanskrit is called shila. These three factors, or these three elements, shila, samadhi, and prana, are called the three higher trainings. These are the basis of all real religions in their heart, in their ultimate nature. Even if the terms are different and the way it's presented may change. These are from the Buddha. 
I use these because they're very simple and easy to understand. There's no belief about it. It's all practical. So to reach samadhi, to reach ecstasy, we have to learn about what prevents it. And this is ethics. The reason our mind is in the state it's in, the reason we suffer, is because of our behavior. If we really want to experience the ecstasy of the soul, to really know what meditation is as a state of consciousness, we can. It's the natural state of every living thing. But we don't experience it because our behaviors prevent it. Anger is a simple example. When you become angry, your whole way of perception is filtered by that anger. Everything you see and hear and think and feel is dictated by the anger. Anger is a conditioning factor. It causes suffering. We suffer, and then we want others to suffer because we're mad. When I'm angry, I'm going to make sure that everyone else suffers too because I'm unhappy. That is a lack of awareness. It is a state of conditioning that causes pain. And in that state, samadhi is impossible. And so is wisdom. We cannot see the reality when we are conditioned by anger. And the same is true of all these other qualities that we all have in abundance. Pride, envy, jealousy, fear, lust, gluttony, avarice. We all have all of that, a lot of it. It's why we suffer. It's why we don't know what God is. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what samadhi is because we persist in poor behaviors. But if we learn this, if we learn to observe the facts of our behaviors and start dropping harmful ones and adopting beneficial ones, we can change that situation. We can turn it around. So ethics is really the doorway to start meditating. That word shila means tendency, habit, custom, way of living or acting, shape, usage, virtue, or practice. A lot of ways to interpret it. I don't like the word morality, which is how many people translate it. Morality is completely subjective. What's moral in this country is immoral in another country. What's moral in this state is immoral in another state. What people in this group over here consider moral is considered immoral by us. So immoral, or morality and immorality are completely subjective. Ethics, on the other hand, are objective. They are universal. Violence is harmful. Anger is harmful. This is universal. Selfishness is harmful. This is universal. So this is what we mean by ethics. It's about learning about our own tendencies, our own habits, our own customs, our own ways of living. Recognizing the ones that cause us to suffer and others to suffer, and starting to change them. That's how we learn to start meditating. Now, <clears throat> when we're doing that, we also should be adopting practices, techniques, to start settling ourselves down if we really want to learn to meditate. So this image provides us a little map that guides us in our efforts to learn how to concentrate. And this is for our preliminary concentration practice. This uh, painting is visible in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries all over the world, and all of the practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism learned this um, map. It outlines in a visual way the process of being a total beginner to step by step gradually learning to calm down and have serenity psychologically. So we study that here. We study all these stages. There's nine essential stages. Specifically at the beginning, we see a monk on this path chasing an elephant who's pulled by a monkey. 
If this seems like a children's book, it should, because this is basic stuff. This is an introductory level of instruction. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not profound. It's actually very profound. So you see behind the monk, there's a temple, a gompa. It has three levels. Those three levels have a lot of meanings. But significantly, they relate to those three levels of instruction that I pointed out. Introductory, middle, and advanced. But they also relate to us. This temple represents us. Body, heart, mind. Body, soul, spirit. It's who we are. And this monk also shouldn't be taken literally. The monk represents our own Buddha nature. Our own consciousness. Not that we have to become monks and nuns. Instead, the monk represents that we need to have the attitude of a serious person. If we want to begin this path and learn to really meditate, we need the attitude of someone who's very serious about their practice. And so the monk is chasing after this elephant and the monkey, and they represent the quality of mind that we all have when we begin. It's like a wild animal. The elephant represents the heaviness and dullness of our mind, and the monkey represents that flightiness of a mind that will never sit still, a mind that's jumping from one thing to another all the time. So we, as a serious person who really wants to change, we have to chase after the elephant and the monkey through our preliminary practices. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.